In Sri Aurobindo's view, the sacrifice on the part of humanity is ongoing and inevitable as human beings interact with all around them. Through our lives and interactions, we give various capacities of ourselves and in exchange receive from our surroundings. Sri Aurobindo describes the purpose underlying this action as being, it's only by giving and receiving that we can progress, that we can grow. In addition, Sri Aurobindo addresses both the level of awareness and the spirit in which the sacrifice is made. He observes that an egoistic or unconscious sacrifice leads only to limited reward, whereas conscious sacrifice offered with love for the divine and commitment to the divine leads to true joy and fulfillment. The underlying purpose of conscious sacrifice, true self-offering, is expressed in his statement, all true love and all sacrifice are in their essence nature's contradiction of the primary egoism and its separative error. It is nature's hurt, meaning nature's attempt to turn from a necessary first fragmentation towards a recovered oneness. I think that's just so wonderful that we participate in sacrifice by our very lives and existence. And this is very consistent with what we've been studying in the Gita, that we ha have no choice but to, as long as we live and breathe, <laughs> we're participating in this constant interchange. And it seems to me that um, to the extent we do so consciously that to the extent that we consciously offer and sacrifice to the divine, we deepen and enrich our experience and of life in the world and our consciousness to a vast degree. And that otherwise we're living very much on in our surface nature and a rather superficial existence if we don't have this, the blessing of this awareness of sacrifice. Martha, can I just uh, maybe interject um, here because this this particular s sentence out of the entire and I didn't realize you wrote this you wrote this article. Yes. Yeah, it's beautiful. This this particular one was very profound to me, and and for a couple reasons. So I'd love to get your your thoughts and your your input um, because what it said to me and and sort of the hope, right? Because sacrifice as we have been kind of talking about it through the, the Gita is it's a, it's a total surrender to the divine. And, and you were just mentioning that. But when I read this, as it says, all sacrifice, it almost makes it more accessible because total surrender is very, very challenging. Um, and by saying all sacrifice, that made me think in this whole idea of, of the exchange and the giving and receiving that to start with, we can, we can simply be offering uh, or surrendering ourselves to someone else. It may be a dear one, it may be a family member, maybe a neighbor in need, but this kind of moving past our own ego and helping or giving, if you will, to someone else can be the start of, of this eventual total surrender to the divine. And, and I just like kind of your thoughts and input on that, but it kind of like gave me, whew, okay, maybe this is possible. Yeah. That's, that's a lovely way to see it, Radha. I think that's very true. Um, we begin where we are, you know, with whatever level of consciousness we are. And we hope ideally, eventually to see the divine in all because we, we know, at least on the intellectual level, that the concept of Brahman is truth and that the divine presence is in everything and in all beings. So, um, I you know, certainly offering, I guess I'll get a little Christian here, as Christ said, you know, do whatever you do to the least of these, you do for me. So that's very much consistent with the concept of Brahman and that um, the divine being in all, whatever we offer, however we can, um, it, it, it's, it serves to, to, to increase the connection with the divine, which is 
ultimately what is transforming to our nature. So we, we need to deepen that connection to make it more, more living, more real and more concrete. So we start with where we are and it progresses from there. So I think that's a very important observation because complete surrender to the divine is beyond most of us in our conception of our lives to, in, in our general daily life. We, we want what we want. We want to have lunch. We want to have breakfast. We want to have dinner. We want a lot of things. And uh, well, if we offer that, the, the, the progression will, will, will grow. The, the connection, the in affinity, the intimacy and bond with the divine will grow. And then we will grow into the capability of, sur of full surrender, but it's a progressive thing. Thank you, thank you. That really helps, appreciate it, Martha. Thank you. I think you've, you've offered a very nice inroad to all that experience and to deepening the sadhana really. So I'll go back to my paper a little bit here and then I'm happy to discuss at any point. But, um, and this, this point that I'm coming to now very much connects with what you were just saying, Rade, that Sri Aurobindo explains the importance of offering all aspects of life and action, the mundane and ordinary, as well as one's inner aspirations and higher thoughts and deeds. Doing so enables the offering to become integral and complete. And as we grow in devotion and intimacy with the divine, uh, we're able to do even more of that. It assists in the realization that not only is all contained within the divine, but also that the divine is in all and the divine is all. When the offering becomes full and integral, an offering of all one's thoughts, feelings, aspirations, and actions, a true and sincere sacrifice of all the parts of the being, it leads to identification with and union with the divine. There are three important results of the sacrifice, of the practice of sacrifice, which Sri Aurobindo details. The first of these is devotion for the divine, which can be cultivated and developed through the discipline of sacrifice. Sri Aurobindo states that our self-offering even without devotion leads ultimately to true devotion. So it is all progressive. This is because the offering of one's actions develops an ongoing connection with the divine that grows in closeness and intimacy. Ultimately, this relationship deepens and grows into a profound love for the divine, thus becoming the yoga of love as well as the yoga of works. This intense, all-encompassing awareness of the divine leads to a knowledge beyond ordinary human perception and mental capacity. The complete consecration of one's being, heart, mind, will, and actions to the divine and an abandonment of egoism is the third result of the practice of sacrifice. All sense of a separate self must be dissolved one must live only for the divine. That is our ideal uh, when we enter the path of yoga, but it is progressive. We just certainly do not get there in a few years. Accordingly, all action will ultimately be done in the service of the divine, for love of the divine and as a selfless offering to the divine alone. In their combined action, the three results of sacrifice love for the divine, knowledge of the divine, and consecration of the entire being to the divine come together to form the triune path. This is the path of yoga based on, the, on work as an offering to the divine and infused with the power of love and devotion and informed and enriched by the power of knowledge. In this threefold path, the th three aspects merge, support, and become one in their progress. The triune path ultimately leads to the true goal of existence, union with the divine. So Sri Aurobindo's use of the term sacrifice is fully in harmony with its original and literal meaning, which is to make holy, to make sacred. So 
So I, the essay com, continues to go on with some aspects of transformation, which uh, somewhat exceed where we are in our discussion in the Gita. But um, I, so I'll cite a few more passages from it. In consonance with the components of the triune path, Sri Aurobindo conceptualizes work itself as threefold, the works of knowledge, the works of love, the works of the will in life. It is the progressive offering of these three to the divine that the being advances from its lower ordinary self to its high spiritualized self. So I think this is, um, it's an important recognition from the um, synthesis of yoga and very much in harmony with what we're studying in the Gita about the significance of sacrifice. Uh, I think we need to remember that it doesn't mean any sense of, uh, of agony or suffering on the part of the human individual. It's, it's offering, it's making holy by offering our works, our lives, our act all our actions um, in service to the divine. And it can begin mechanically. I think Sri Aurobindo mentions that and somewhat stresses it in essays on the Gita. I mean, in, sorry, synthesis of yoga. It can begin mechanically um, with an aspiration to make it more complete and more genuine. And then that aspiration will be fulfilled in time. It takes deepening of practice it takes uh, increasing sincerity of aspiration, and then it, de it develops as, and also it's, Sri Aurobindo points out very much so that it consistent with the message from the Gita that we're not to withdraw from works. Um, work and action done in offering to the divine, um, we're, we're freed from the consequences of that, to the, to the, from the karmic consequences for those actions to the extent that this is fully offered. That's a, an important caveat, I think. But um, this liberation is ultimately achievable and it's, it's a, a beautiful message from the Gita and also from Sri Aurobindo in um, the synthesis of yoga. Yeah, wonderful. Um, there are more impressions from you of what I received. Um, he's uh, dealing with religion, it's very important, and with asceticism, how he looks at it, and then uh, at the end how he says that everything, every path is to be considered only as provisional, actually, not as a major path. Everything helps as long as it helps to proceed on the path and to get the experience. But until the supramental is realized and fulfilled in our life, we are not safe from any, any bypassing, any deviation, any stumblings, because we live in this nature, in nature of the mind, vital and body, and they are part of the bigger nature. And there are many forces in, in this nature which may enter in the name of the divine or in the name of the better path or better solution or faster solution or anything. And we see this pitfalls. They are mentioned also in Savitri and in the Veda as misleading dawns. Yes, there could be misleading dawns. So uh, the path is quite, uh, <laughs> quite an adventure in a way towards the divine. Yes, it's wonderful that Sri Aurobindo knows human nature mm. perfectly well. He knows all the traps that and obstacles that we may fall prey to yet he yet we have for the transformation of our nature to be complete we have to engage in life in the world we have to take all those chances mm -hmm. and we have to soldier through somehow and uh, meet those challenges whatever the nature of they uh, whatever the nature of them 
and mm -hmm. um, ultimately will triumph. It may take many, many lives, but that's our, that's our job. That's why we're here. Otherwise, we would never realize the divine in pure sense. And even that, what people find through Advaitic way, and usually that is accepted because, because uh, this path is so difficult to transform nature that uh, many of those great sadhaks in, in the past uh, decided to bypass this path and go straight to the spirit and dissolve themselves in the spirit. Somewhere he says about this that he is not sure that this is the final emancipation uh -huh, and freedom because, uh, <laughs> because once we are free from the nature, the whole intention of the divine to come down that first sacrifice of the divine was intended for manifestation and we all as souls as sparks of the divine agreed to do that so once we are free <laughs> we may be sent back to do it again and again until it is done and this is something to think of because usually that is what is offered, There's some solution of, you know, dissolving into the spirit. Why should I bother about this nature? As I remember, we were in the, in the Ramana Maharshi Sashram, and there are many sadhus there, you know, all kind of teachers. And one of those sadhus was saying, to hell with all this nature, to hell with all this world. He wants only the divine, as it were. It doesn't work that way. To hell with this world will not do the job. There's you, no uh, escape. <laughs> there's no escape. <laughs> it's quite an interesting thing. Yeah, For many people, it's um, unthinkable in India today because they're so used to this, as he says, separation on nature and spirit which religion provides, actually. Religion being formed by the overmental consciousness, not supramental, provides that division. Spirit elsewhere, nature is here. Nature is the problem. Spirit is the solution. This is what, what we are de dealing with. But supramental, he says that it's such a beautiful quotation I want to read from your article, if you don't mind. Uh, uh, it's somewhere at the end already, um, where the supramental is being realized more and more. Oh, here it is. Uh, as the light of each of these higher powers, these higher powers, higher mind, illumined mind, intuition, overmind, and finally supermind, as the light of each of these higher powers is turned upon the human activities of knowledge, any distinction of sacred and profane, human and divine, begins more and more to fade until it is finally abolished as otios. For whatever is touched and thoroughly penetrated by the divine gnosis is transfigured and becomes a movement of its own light and power, free from uh, turbidity and limitations of the lower intelligence. It is not a separation of some activities, but a transformation of them all by the change of the informing consciousness that, that is the way of liberation, an ascent of the sacrifice of knowledge to a greater and ever greater light and force. It's not that or maybe that. But somewhere he says that it becomes more and more strange, this separation of spirit and matter, that it becomes more and more bizarre. How can we separate this world from the divine and say that it is something else? The higher we rise, the more we can see that it is impossible to separate nature and the spirit. 
And this is something which Sri Aurobindo offers, which no other path is speaking about, integral yoga. It's really beautiful. Thank you for this essay. It was wonderful. If you have something, uh, some wants to share, with you most probably you read the essay. And if you have some thoughts, please, Teresa, Charles, whoever, Siegfried, Elia. We we were discussing with Elia today also on the sacrifice in our classroom, in our Sanskrit studies. We spend half of our time discussing the sacrifice. Mm. Uh, Vladimir, mm. if I make can make a point about what Rade was referring to, uh, doing something for other human beings, be it charity, what have you. I think if you keep in mind what the Christians believe as well as Hindus, that there is a divinity within us. So when you are doing action for anybody, if you are focused on it as being a sacrifice for the divinity within that person, then your thinking becomes less individualistic. It, it, it takes a different dimension. You know? the, 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 it becomes a more genuine offering because you're offering it to divinity, not that other individual that you may have some expectations from. But if you yeah. limit it to just focus on the divinity, uh, the offering is the divinity in the other individual, or other entity. You know? Right, right. Mother spoke about uh, this uh, for Aurovillians. She spoke about collaboration, and she said many times that we should forget our preferences, our own ideas, what is right and what is wrong. She was so insisting on it that it's nearly going away from the path of discovering one's own truth or something. One's own truth is a very small thing in a way. You have, we have to see a bigger picture. We have to allow the bigger truth to penetrate and come down and show us who we truly are, which we do not know. So uh, she insisted on this collaboration. I remember how she put all the hands together of all these parties, which when she left her body, went into the court houses, started court cases and war forever, which is not ending even now. So this kind of collaboration never happened because people are so self-obsessed with their own understanding of what is right and what is wrong. It is such a small scale what we know, what is true and what is not true. We are judging the world on a small scale, as she says. Whatever you can do the best, whatever you can do the worst is a very small scale. You have to have a bigger, vaster picture and see everyone as a part of this enterprise. And then work for the world. And that liberates your spirit, liberates your heart, liberates everything. <laughs> you don't need to be this small being, you know. I was um, discussing this with Elia today. It's really kind of strange thing. If you imagine that you live only for yourself, how difficult and uninteresting life becomes. Everything, you may have all the resources and it is so suffocating. But the moment you open up, the moment you do disinterested action for others, you feel immediately that your spirit is liberated. This is the sacrifice. I think too in that, you know, that same sentence um, that we spoke about earlier, it talks about uh, towards a recovered oneness. Right. So to, to me, this true love and this all sacrifice, this recovered oneness is what it's it's our sense of unity with others. Right. So the minute we forget our own ego, our own needs, our own wants, our own demands, what we're trying to get out of the world or a situation and turn our attention towards others. To me, that's the first step of tapping into this kind of secret oneness with this, this unity that's behind everything and that it starts to widen and that sense of 
separateness or that division that comes with the ego slowly, slowly, slowly starts to melt. And it is progressive um, in, in my mind uh, too, as Martha was saying, is that you've, you've got to start with where you are, but anything that turns your attention away from the ego and towards others, either through true love, right? Selfless, unconditional love, or through sacrifice, through offering, begins or allows you to participate genuinely in this cycle of giving and receiving and helps to start to surrender the ego. So it's, um, it's really a beautiful pa paper, Martha. I was just so happy uh, when I read this and as Vladimir said, it just kind of put things in a very, very accessible way uh, about the, the sacrifice and brought out some, some nuances that I hadn't thought about before. Um, yes. So I really, really appreciate it. Thank you. I really appreciate your feedback. Mm -hmm. I think what you say about um, oneness and sense of separation is so true. Um, when we stop focusing on ourselves and open out, it's a wonderful opening of the heart. And I think the basic human empathy emanates from our inherent sense of oneness. Because we, and we even, you know, we get sad when we read novels in which somebody suffers, <laughs> you know. <laughs> we, we just are connected. And there's so many things that point to that reality. Teresa, <laughs> so what's going on, my dear? <laughs> we got a tissue going. <laughs> Please share. <laughs> well, I, you know, I had an experience uh, last week, and, and I received a letter from a, a, a dear, a, a person who was very dear to me. And the letter was very disparaging, and it, and it threw me off guard, and it was really it was really upsetting to me and, and, and I was hurt, I was angry. And it was in that moment that I, that I decided to offer that up to the divine, that that was my sacrifice. And it was only then could I release myself from all of those feelings and, and, then, and then try to figure out a way of trying to meet that person where they were. And, and you know, Normally, when I think of things like sacrifice and devotion, they're, they're loving things or divine things or things worthy of the divine. But this was a totally different thing where it was my, my pain and my sorrow and my, and my anger that I was offering to, to really be transformed. So for myself, that. Uh... I've learned along the way that what Teresa is talking about is the very things that we treasure the most. And so that's the real sacrifice for me. It's, it's not, in the beginning it was, I wanted to give my life or things that I owned. And then I realized that it was my own it was my own self judgment. Um, and that the, the things that I held back and the sacrifice were the things that I valued the most. So if I sacrifice 99% and I hold back 1%, the value that I have on the 1% is greater than the 99%. And that really gets into the whole self-identity conversation. And then the other that I've thought of before is uh, I go back to my limited understanding of um, um, what the gunas. And for me, Raja Guna is someone, the, the man that is uh, Rajistic obeys the law of God because they understand the law and looking for a reciprocal action. And sattvic is simply doing the thing, the right thing because it's the right thing to do with no motive of doing that. So then on the conversation of sacrifice, um, this is a question I'm asking. If the sacrifice is done in order to achieve something, 
or to attain something or to get something back from the sacrifice. Is that really a sacrifice? By the way, in the essay, you can find the answer to it. It is there. It's very beautiful, very subtle. Sri Aurobindo touches upon this, that actually, he says, it is not that you get nothing in return. You get the divine presence in return. It changes everything, all relations, all understanding, all the state of being. That's what you are hoping for. You want to give the whole world to the divine to become the divine. Yeah? We say that we give disinterestedly, without any strings attached. We must do it this way because our ego is always claiming, always trying to get something out of it for ourselves. Okay, I do this for you and you did do this for me. This is the bargain, you know, which, is, which is destroying the sacrifice. And when we do it disinterestedly, our soul knows that we are getting everything by that, <laughs> everything what we need to get. And that's the best um, offering which Mother says, let me uh, do what you want me to do. Let me know what you want me to know. Let me be what you want me to be. No claim of one's own at all. This is the highest, so there is no more uh, this uh, uh, strings attached from the vital desire or from the mental preference. Or, so that's why we have to remove those preferences. But our soul knows that we get everything, the best we need for our growth. Can't be otherwise. The divine provides the best. Yeah. But it, but it sort of brings into question what Charles is mentioning is, is to come back to this idea of all life is yoga, right? All life is sacrifice, whether we know it or not, whether it's done consciously or unconsciously. So no matter what we do, even if it's it appears for us to be selfish, you know, I'm only going to do this if I get this out of it. In all, in all ways, uh, we're still doing some type, at some level, we're doing a yoga, we're doing a sacrifice. We're just doing it very, very unconsciously. Um, and if we were conscious of it, uh, that would not even come into to play. Um, but I, I have to, to believe that b because of that quote, that no matter what we do, somehow that sacrifice is, is, is being done. Um, as um, selfishly or ugly as it may appear. Um, so. It also says, okay. like to what Radhe was saying, like nature kind of takes the sacrifice from us, like, like for everything we have to do, like work or even if we are working for family or for ourselves, it's way of nature taking us only when we start doing it consciously for the divine, then the conscious yoga begins. By the way, you find this quotation in this essay, again, on this what you are saying, Dolan. Exactly this quotation where Sri Aurobindo says about this. Interestingly, all these topics are there. Yes, uh, that, um... uh, Vladimir? Yes. Uh, are we not all instruments of the divide? from totally unconscious to partially conscious to fully conscious. The each one is evolving, each one of us at our own pace from a totally unconscious to a fully conscious. But we are all instruments of this divine play. Yeah, yeah. Is that a correct idea? Yeah, absolutely. And uh, that's what uh, Sri says, first nature pushes us unconsciously. She forces us to do something for others. So you, we have these instincts of the uh, mother cat who will protect her kittens and die for them okay. or feed them or whatever. She gives her life for these kittens yeah, without thinking, without even anything of uh, back thought of uh, some kind of surviving. And uh, at the same time, once we become more aware of this in the mind, 
then we have a possibility to choose to connect to the Divine Presence and to see the Oneness. That's what he says in the quotation. Uh, it's so beautiful. We, we have more chances. We have more capacity now, from now on. We can choose what to do with our lives. Yeah, it will be very difficult because our nature is in built in this lower consciousness, but still, still, and until the supramental is there, all this is only provisional. Religions, asceticism, whatever helps, whatever helps to purify the nature and to become aware of the Divine Presence until it is totally manifested, it is all only the means and not the aim. This we have to remember, that we are dealing with the means, with instruments only. But I also want to bring another point, like, uh, so I think we'll have to do it a bit consciously because in India, there, it's a more collective society where, uh, where people are doing for each other and it's a more societal thing. And there are both advantages and disadvantages, like advantages is ob obviously that learning to give to others and to live for others, but there are also sometimes disadvantages that it prevents the individual growth and self-expression, there is a suppression of it. And when we come to the West, we meet a completely different where we have the maximum possibility and potentiality to progress as a self, as an individual person. And there is no bar, there is complete freedom to totally uh, like, to totally experience oneself and to progress oneself. And there is very less bar by the society, but at the same time, it stifles that collective thing. So I think there is somewhere, because both has good and bad aspects, so somewhere it is necessary to integrate and do it more as a process of consciousness and offering to the divine so that neither is suppressed, neither the individual nor the society. It all depends on the inner attitude, I believe, yeah? Uh, you can uh, do seemingly the same things as everybody else does, but your inner connection will be very different. Um, you will look the same as everybody else. There are people, just when you were talking, it reminded me of people who would never give any gift without the camera taking a snap of them giving a gift to others. Yeah, so this is the kind of sacrifice which is very selfish in a way, which needs some other things to, you know, to happen, some other aims. Uh, so, but still, still, even this, even this, because nature forces them to do this altruism, this kind of, that other businesses have to take care of the environment, of uh, gender equality, and so on and so forth, you know. The whole nature is forcing everyone, every selfish being, <laughs> to become le less selfish, ecological disasters, and so on and so forth. Virus, now there's pandemics. Everybody is forced to take care of everyone else. Free vaccination for all. Un incredible, unbelievable, in a way. Uh, you see how nature is dealing with us. <laughs> and slowly we start liking it, liking that position of being free, mm. uh, taking care of others, something opens up within us, and we are ready to continue in that way. That's what I, the reference to what Dolan was saying, that's what the mother tried to create in the ashram, is remove all social obligations, including from the parents. So everybody was only committed to uh, look into the mother for everything. She did the same in Auroville, where you know you, you were given the total freedom, which is so antithetical to the Indian society. You know? But she created this unique bubble where girls, boys, long before it became uh, Title IX, which happened in the US, giving girls equal funding for sports and college and all of that. His mother had started there in the 40s. There was no difference, differentiation of any kind, you know, uh, age or gender, you know, but she, but she was setting the, setting the goal, I think, you know, the rest of the world, you know, total freedom to choose. You know. 
it's quite interesting about Auroville again. So when, when people wanted to frame Auroville with certain behavior, <laughs> they came to the mother and said, we must have some rules and regulations for Auroville. Yeah? How would we know whom to accept and whom to reject and to check on people? Some rules, give us rules. And mother says, as long as there are no rules and regulations, there is still a hope for Auroville. Yeah. Just think about this. That inner choice, that inner recognition of the truth, that self-giving, which, which cannot be done by force, it has to be done consciously willingly. That's what Shubindu says in that quotation in your article, that voluntary, that willing uh, surrender is the key to the speeding up of the whole process. Not by the force of nature, not by the laws that you are made a good citizen because you are afraid to be jailed or something but because you can't do it otherwise, it comes from you. And there, are, there are many examples in Aribal of that kind of dedication and pure giving, joy of giving. You know, I work with some of the individuals there, it's just unbelievable. They, the joy, that's all they find, whether they are handicapped, whether they are ill, just going out and working out there with Mati Mandar, regardless of the conditions. Yeah. It's, it's something very, very unusual. Yeah. This matrimonial experience, yes. What people say, you would not believe how happy they were to work, uh, hard working, yeah. and such a happiness. Maybe you, Robert, would like to mention something, you know, about yeah. our reveal and the mother. Yeah. Well, well, I, I think uh, just first of all, I'd like to say we we talk a lot, a lot about sacrifice and. We think of it as we can tend to think of it as a, a difficult to pasture, but we've always got the help of the divine. And uh, there are many. Uh, I mean, even the, I think there was a, an English, the English mystic poet um, William Blake. He wrote a poem called "The Hound of Heaven," so that gives the the, the idea that it is the divine that is searching for the the aspirant, and it's not just our own effort that's required. Um, because we get a lot of help on the way. So if we take one step towards the divine, the divine takes two or three steps towards us. And, and um, that, that is part of the process too. And I, I, I think we need to remember that also. Um, regarding the Auroville and the Matramandi, it was just a, a wonderful experience. Um, I was in, I, I worked on the Matramandi for about eight years and it was, it was quite miraculous. I mean, we were, most of us had very little experience of construction work. And yet we were, there we were, um, just in a pair of shorts. Uh, we even went on a, on a structure with bare feet, uh, working with concrete and steel and scaffolding and just with our spanners and uh, measuring tapes and chalk and so on, marking up the where to put the scaffolding and so on. And it was it was just amazing that it, it worked out. I mean, it was a total, uh, looking back, it was a constant miracle, quite honestly. Nobody got hurt, or very few, very small, small accidents. And the work went on despite everything, despite all the setbacks. This was in the, mostly in the 80s when there was a lot of trouble with the society. And uh, the work kept going on. I mean, it never stopped completely. And it was, uh, I think it was one of the most fulfilling experiences for me was just coming down at the end of the day. We'd been on the structure for, well, sometimes seven or eight hours in the blazing sun, carrying these six meter scaffolding poles, men and women. And um, we were not tired, we came down at the end of the day and it was the most fulfilling thing, I think. You come down the structure, down these vertical ladders with your bare feet and you you come down to the bottom and you, you, I remember my toes sort of wiggling in the dust at the, around the edge of the structure and it was feeling totally fulfilled. I just, uh, it's 
it's just a wonderful time. And that now it's complete. I mean, I, it, the work went slowly sometimes, it went very slowly. But then it went in great spurts, and now the whole structure is complete. And I think that's that's one of the wonders of the world, quite frankly. Yeah, thank you for sharing these uh, moments. They are always very precious because the presence in the most difficult work, unbelievably uh, not uh, kind of uh, impossible to imagine for any kind of other spiritual, without spirit, it would not be possible to do. It's with the presence of the mother, it becomes a marvel in itself. So what to say about ordinary life, <laughs> everyday life, uh, so it could be... It was Karma Yoga of the purest form, you know. Mm -hmm. Purest form of Karma Yoga, you know. Just pure joy and pure offering. It's amazing, I think, what people did there. You know. Of course, we are caught by her. We are totally dependent on her. We want only her sweetness in our life. We don't want anything else. We are ready to give. What's what's wrong to give everything to the divine to be the divine? What's what's wrong about this? With this, it's the right thing to do. Anyhow, we can't keep anything for ourselves here in this world. It does not belong to us. It belongs to the divine. So why not to return it and give it back in order to become the divine in everyday moment of our life? Thank you for sharing. This is very moving. Thank you. Thank you so much, Robert. And thank you for doing all that incredible, incredible uh, love of work and, and giving. I, I, I had the honor a couple of years ago to uh, to, to be in the Mat Mandir and stay uh, in Arville for a couple of months. And it's absolutely, absolutely wonderful and beautiful. So really, thank you for your dedication. My privilege. Some more thoughts? Yeah, that's a really high bar. <laughs> what do you do? It's a very how do you, high. How do, you, how do you follow that one? Thank <laughs> oh, Let's Maybe. see. Today I... <laughs> <laughs> Wonderful examples to keep in mind. Yeah. But that's great. That's such a high bar. So there may be some inspiration comes... Uh, one interesting observation, a good friend of mine, Josh Brooks, who has been uh -huh. managed, uh, created the Pichandikulam mm. forest, you know, so I've been interacting with him for a number of years now. So he was, the last time they had a cyclone a few years ago, and all three, trees were destroyed, you know, lots of them in, in the forest. So, I mean, his attitude towards it was so joyous regardless of what happened and he's observing nature around him and he's, he told me that the plants that were native to the area so came to... back a lot faster <laughs> right. than what had been brought from uh, from other parts of the world yeah yeah he's so those he's are the kind of observations you making yes yes In, instead of mourning and bemoaning the, you know the destruction you're looking at how it is nature is coming back in, in, in a selective fashion almost now. You know, his philosophy is the indigenous plants. He always wants to, on the indigenous right, right, plants. Right, right, yeah. And not these kind of foreign plants brought from other parts. Well, rapid grow, not, yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah no, yes. now, and it, now he has these night cameras, so he's seeing a lot of the 
species, animals, small birds, all coming back to the area as, as the forestation has grown, you know, and the natural plants have come back in the area. You're seeing life coming back in different forms, you know. Mm. Yeah, it, it's been there over 40 years. I was just talking to him a couple of weeks ago. And, you know, he's had some back problems. He's walking with two sticks, but he said he has just spent the whole day at the Matri Mandir, you know working around the garden and stuff, you know. The... Jos is not well, you say. Yeah, he has, yeah, he has had some, poor guy, some health, health issues, you know. Yeah, yeah. It's inspiration every time I go, I spend a day with him. You know, we will this place, you know. It's been some a wonderful mm. work with the school also, you know, that is open. If you, if you see him say uh, hi from me, I will. I will, I will be, I will be calling him. I usually connect with him. Mm. Uh, once a month, or, you know, so, so I will definitely tell him that he said hi. Sweet man. Yeah. You know, we, <laughs> we had a joke in our reveal. I would not go into it, but it doesn't matter. <laughs> um, it's, uh, anyhow, you know, when you grow such community and you can see the beauty in every aspect of Auroville's uh, life, that presence of the mother on Matri Mandir, which uh, Robert was mentioning, is pre can be present in every other activity, in the afforestation, in uh, water conservation, you name it, you know, uh, just go and do something with the, with the land. Because that focal, focal point, that presence of the divine is there. And he, many people who come to Oroville, they feel it. It's independent from anybody else. It's just there. You just enter and you cycle through our will and you feel that presence. And you don't know what it is, but it feels so good, so at home. You know? In the morning when you uh, drive your motorbike, it is such a pleasant, blissful state. I can't express it. Everything, sun, wind, uh, forest, um, just like in the paradise of some kind. Uh, growing up there, that part was basically barren red soil. And that, but yeah, red soil, beautiful. Yeah, we go with my friend, we go bike riding to that area, you know. Yeah, there was some cashew trees, it was basically it, but very, very hot, very barren, you know. It's amazing when you go there, you can, from what I remember, my childhood too is just uh, different, totally amazing. Mm -hmm. Siegfried, you wanted to say something? Yeah, you are, you are getting very nostalgic. <laughs> <laughs> and this morning I, I was uh, riding by with my motorbike. Uh, I have a motorbike for this for this year, one year ago, and is um, most of the same motorbike which uh, I hi I rent when I was in Auroville. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and today I was riding the motorbike without helmet, mm -hmm. like when no, no, no. I was in Auroville, <laughs> <laughs> and I was. Uh, feeling the, the wind in, in my hair, mm. my skin, like when I was there. Mm. And then with this, I want to introduce, uh, we, can, we can experience uh, Auroville in all, everywhere ah. where we are, because finally it's in, in us, which yes. can, with uh, this kind of uh, experience uh, or predisposition to experience the presence is in us. Then we can um, activate this, mm -hmm. this uh, uh, feeling everywhere. Mm -hmm. I, I'm, I'm experienced here. I, I, even I have a domo in the garden, <laughs> which I call uh, Machimondi as well. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, now I want to use the, the chance to, to talk, to, to offer my interpretation of the sacrifice, mm -hmm. the topic of today. And um, I, 
I feel some sim simili similitude, similitude is, is a similarity. Mm. Similarities, thank you, uh, with the um, great void, with emptiness. Mm. And what I'm, um, uh, what I'm uh, feeling every time more close and close, when we are talking about sacrifice, aspiration, descending, the, the dissolution of the ego sense or the, to, to the, pur the purification of the egocentric concept, all of these processes are like a tantric process of discovering the, the complementarity of everywhere, which is the great void in essence, is the great void of the egocentric point of view is a great void where every everything every phenomenon every every soul is included it's not an empty great void it's a full great void of everything in at everywhere and what what i uh, into in tweet in the in the in my understanding of sacrifice is this um, is a challenge uh, experience in the in the daily life in the every second when you are working when you are breathing you can have the chance to to experience that if you uh, if you invite yourself to lose the egocentric, then it becomes this experience of, uh, you can see the sacrifice in the fire of the breathing in, breathing out, but you can experience the space, a limited space in you. And this is what I am experiencing in, in, when I uh, make um, this, you know, it's like, um, like uh, w when you see the stars in the night, you can see this twin light. Is it twin light? Is the pro proper word? Twinkle little star. Yeah? Twinkle. Twinkle or something, I don't know the word. But, you know, sometimes you are full in, in the mechanic, full in the, in the thinking process, full in, the, in your personal existence, your ego sense, but sometimes it's a click. You can oh, lose absolutely yourself and, and try, find the balance between this, this uh, divergent uh, attitudes. It's a, it's a, it's a nice uh, try, uh, dance, you know, try this dance to be open to the great void and to be open to the mechanical of what we are in this human constitution with this kind of conditioning, uh, proceding, procedure and, and material, chemical, physical reactions uh, which we are embodied. No? And what I, I want to say in, in, in this interpretation, which I personally have, is becomes a question. Who, who is experienced the sacrifice? Who is there? Who is? And the answer became uh, is the psychic being. If, if we want to know the psychic being, we only have to make us this personal question. Who is making the sacrifice? Who is uh, open to the challenge to be in the great void, abysm and fulfilled? And then you find your own psychic being who is ready for that, who is looking for that challenge. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Siegfried. Yeah.
the great void nirvana silence is needed to remove all the all the noises from nature from the vital from preferences it purifies our perception and then maybe the inner being may may be perceived or uh, become tangible for its presence and may be found and come to the front thank you for sharing these ideas these thoughts they are very valuable to all of us um so may we I still... have one? May yeah I, may yeah I just, please may I just, add just a moment onto um Siegfried's um, conversation because you know I'm new to this mm. um but uh the reason I joined the group was to be with you um after watching some of the videos and what what happened in some of the videos I would just feel very deeply things like feel in my body and and ha and I think it has to do with words right and I and my observation is just like I, I've heard the words interchange um sacrifice and surrender and to me just just from where i come from for me it's it's hard to be close to the word sacrifice because i feel like it's other mm -hmm. and i feel like it's giving up something not myself like sacrificing and slaughter and like the, the common you know outside of this it's mainly common it's a word that's it's in, if i feel it in my body it just you know go down but um when Teresa was speaking it to me that was more of a like a surrender and it just felt so good you could feel there and more just of a flow and and kind of being in flow with life and, and the same thing with the word nature and probably just feel it differently but I feel you know that we're constantly in re, we're in relation with nature we are nature so maybe that's a different type of nature that we're talking about here so i'm just sharing this as a perspective of you know someone that doesn't know this very well <laughs> so, thank you thank you for sharing actually the same discussion we had with elia about the same topic that for her sacrifice was a very damaging and killing for some get something done for oneself for one's ego and or giving something which you love for the sake of getting something else you know which you must get that's usually the idea but sacrifice is making sacred yeah so to say it's actually just the opposite it's very bright it's like you're inviting higher powers of your universal consciousness to to come and take your burden as uh, Teresa was mentioning you can sacrifice not only good things but especially things which are uh, problematic for us and they are taken by this presence and changed and mother says that the real sadhaks, the real ones, are those who bring to me their problems and difficulties and not the best things. Who do not want to see only to be seen as good ones, but on, come as weak and in difficulty for help. And that is the way of also making everything changing in your life, making it sacred offering your difficulty to the divine <laughs> asking for help as a child would ask the mother and you will receive it it will be there you will be surprised how simple it is and luminous and it has nothing to do with mutilation or some kind of you know killing or blood sacrifice killing the goat for the sake of something it's not the thing mm. Yes, and everything you just said, I, I feel that it's just associated with a different word. I know, you know, I know. it's just the word. So yeah. like having a nice being able to dialogue and, and see what comes into the circle, you know, is I think a real, um, real gift that you offer. So thank you. Thank you for sharing. Yeah, before we before we end, I gotta, um, I everybody um, just everybody and Kimberly you just you, you tied it up with a bow on it for me because 
this morning I did, I was talking with Vladimir about exactly what you said. It's like, what does this mean? This word sacrifice is just triggering and it doesn't make sense. And when I'm listening to everybody today talk about sacrifice and, 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 and receiving and giving and the flow, um, Martha, that you had mentioned. And it's like, I, I can kind of get a feeling of that, but this conversation here has brought more than just the words to me. Cause the words I've heard, I got the words, I know the words. But there's a feeling here. There's the, and Vladimir and um, and Rodhead. This this is really nice to have everybody on the screen for the whole time and no no pages of words and just having conversations. And this is just this is beautiful and it's been just an amazing experience. And I just wanted to say that. So thank you. Thank you, Elia. Thank you, everyone. So I will close with mantra. Om Sarve Bhavantu Sukhinaha Sarve Santo Niramaya Sarve Bhadrani Pashyantu Makashchit Dukha Bhag Bhavet Om Shanti 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 Shri Guru Namaha Hari Om. Hari Om. Hari Om. Namaste. 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 Namaste.